There exists within the realm of music a place where conventions are challenged, sacred cows are tipped, and the art of reinvention is not lost on anyone. To get to this place, you need to go outside the music box. It's a podcast about people centered on music, and it begins now. Hello everyone and welcome to Outside the Music Box. My name is James Newcomb and I will be your Master of Ceremonies in this episode. Today we're talking the ins and outs of intellectual property. And according to my guest, Stefan Kinsella, intellectual property should definitely be out. Stefan is a legal theorist. He is a patent attorney in Houston, Texas. And he's also the author of a book called Against Intellectual Property. In his book, Stefan takes the view that Intellectual property is not property at all, and to consider things such as ideas, songs, recipes, code to be property actually hinders the value of real property. Property meaning things that we can physically own, such as real estate, cars, houses, etc. Now people listening to this will probably object, saying, well, we have to have intellectual property. If we didn't have intellectual property, then anyone could take my uh, idea and profit from it. So therefore, I must protect myself so that other people don't use my own ideas for profit. Stefan can obviously articulate his points and his positions better than I can, so I'm going to leave that to him. The reason I brought him on is I simply want people to think a little more broadly. Maybe look at this issue in a different light than you may have heard in the past. So we're going to get into my interview with Stefan Kinsella in just a moment. But I want to read an article that I found uh, on Facebook. And it is related to David Bowie, who sadly passed away just this past week. And it's interesting that I found it because it perfectly ties in with our topic of intellectual property. Uh, Bowie was actually a bit of a forward thinker as far as... Uh, how he saw the music industry was going to turn in the future. Um, And I'm just going to read this short article. It's by Anthony Fisher, and it's uh, titled, David Bowie foresaw the collapse of the music industry and adjusted accordingly. The late, great David Bowie wasn't just a gender-bending shapeshifter and a persona generator. He was the rare rock star who not only survived the ravages of drug addiction, but also had enough sense of self-preservation to diversify his economic portfolio uh, before the music industry imploded. In 1997, under the guidance of banker David Pullman, the creation of Bowie Bonds allowed the musician to sell the royalty rights to the 25 albums he recorded before 1990 for a lump sum of $55 million, with the buyer of the bonds receiving all future revenue brought in by Bowie's back catalog plus 8% interest. Seems like a good deal. At the time, Moody's blessed the bonds with quality A rating. From Bowie's point of view, his financial future was too dependent on the vagaries of his popularity. By selling some of his royalty income to others, Bowie was able to diversify his investments. He reduced the risk that a major shift in the public's musical taste would leave him a pauper. Meanwhile, investors who had not previously had any stake in the sales of Ziggy Stardust could diversify into that area and earned a decent interest rate while doing so. In 2002, the erstwhile Bowie presciently told the New York Times, quote, the absolute transformation of everything that we ever thought about music will take place within 10 years and nothing is going to be able to stop it. I see absolutely no point in pretending that it's not going to happen. I'm fully confident that copyright, for instance, will no longer exist in 10 years, and authorship and intellectual property is in for such a bashing. Music itself is going to become like running water or electricity. So it's like, just take advantage of these last few years, because none of this is ever going to happen again. You'd better be prepared for doing a lot of touring, because that's really the only unique situation that's going to be left. It's terribly exciting, but on the other hand, it doesn't matter if you think it's exciting or not. It's what's going to happen. David Bowie saw the handwriting on the wall, so to speak. He had the ability to see that the music industry, as he knew it, and the way that he made a fortune, was 
in for a very rapid change. So it's a very interesting timing for that article to be uh, to come to the surface right when this episode is releasing. So before we move into my interview with Stefan, allow me to take just a moment to tell you about a gift that I would like to give you. There's no obligation. There is no email list to sign up for. I simply want you to have it. It's called The Go-Getter, and it's a very short story written by Peter Kine in the 1920s, and it's indispensable for salesmen, entrepreneurs, anyone with ambition in any facet of life. It is my gift to you. Go to OutsideTheMusicBook.com, and while you're at OutsideTheMusicBook.com, consider a trial run of Audible. You can have an audiobook of your choice delivered straight to your device, your computer, and even if you cancel your membership before the 30-day trial ends, you get to keep that book for free. Go to OutsideTheMusicBook.com for more information. So, ladies and gentlemen, here is my conversation on intellectual property with Stefan Kinsella. Well, Stefan, for the benefit of people listening to this, let's just get a working definition of property. And I'm referring to a statement that you made in your book, uh, Doing Business Without Intellectual Property. It's more of a pamphlet than a book. But you said that intellectual property is a blatant infringement of property rights. So before we uh, get into that, let's just get a working definition for purposes of this interview. What exactly is property in your view? Property rights um, is the legal respect that gives someone the exclusive right to control a given resource. So, you know, we live in the world, we're physical beings. There are things that we need to control and use in our daily lives. And as we produce and live, we need control over those things. Those things have a nature that we call in economics scarcity, or sometimes economists call it rivalrous, which just means there's a type of resource that can only be used by one person at a time. Um, and if you don't have a set of rules that determine who the owner is, then you could have conflict or physical fighting over these things. Okay, So if you build a house, then you get the right to use it and control it. So the word property technically means a property right in a resource. It just identifies who the owner of a resource is. Sometimes people use the word property to also refer to the thing owned, so they'll say that house is my property. But technically speaking, I would say you're the owner of the resource. You're the owner of the house. You have a property right in the house. I think the word property is used because we recognize that when we act in the world, we extend our influence in the world by using these other means of action you know, like um, houses and food and uh, tools. It helps extend us into the world, so it becomes a property of yourself in a sense. It sort of it extends the identity of what and who you are. So I think that's why the word property is used. But really, it's the question is who has a proprietary interest that is an ownership interest in a given resource. So property rights really is just a system where we can identify who owns a thing so that we can all respect that right and so that they can be used peacefully and in trade without us having to physically fight and clash over those things. Very good. Now, how would uh, – what is the difference between, in your view, uh, property as you just defined it and intellectual property, such as ideas, uh, songs that are written? What is the difference between, uh, like, a tune that I, that I come up with in my head and that I write down on a piece of paper? How is that not property, in your view? Yeah, I, yeah and, uh, I wouldn't say that it's not property. What I would say is it's not the type of thing which can be the subject of property rights. It's not something that's ownable. A tune is a pattern of information, right? It's just knowledge. Uh, it's it's a pattern that tells you how you can manipulate an instrument or your vocal cords to create a sound that might be pleasing or useful or whatever. Um, a software program is just a pattern of information. The design of a new automobile. Uh, engine or component is just information that people can use. So if you understand what human action is, and this is sort of an economics concept that the Austrian economist school um, talks about a, a lot, but it's very common sense. 
when we when we work in the world, when we act in the world, we have to employ these scarce resources. We have to use our body, which is a scarce resource, and other things like I mentioned earlier, tools, food, uh, land, uh, lumber, things like that. You have to use those things to get things done. However, you also have to make a decision about what to do. In other words, your action, your use of these scarce means, the things that are subject to property rights and that are owned – your action is guided by knowledge or information that we have in our brains, in our, in our minds. So there are two important aspects to human action. One is the ability to employ these scarce resources, but also the knowledge that you have in your head that, that helps you choose what to do and to hopefully have more successful rather than unsuccessful action. The domain of scarce resources that we have to use is subject to property rights because there's the possibility of conflict over them. Things like tunes, like songs, like poetry, like novels, like inventions are knowledge that guides what we do. But these things are not subject to conflict, and they cannot be owned actually. Um, it's possible for a billion people to use the idea that uh, cooking food with fire makes it safer and more tasty than eating raw meat. Everyone can use that idea at the same time. They don't have to conflict with each other to use that idea. The same thing with a song. Everyone can sing the same song in their own house at the same time um, without conflicting with each other. So the idea of property rules, which is designed to avoid conflict, makes no sense when it comes to things that are infinitely – I won't say infinitely abundant, but they're infinitely copyable and they're usable by many people at the same time. So the problem is when the law treats – tries to treat things like – songs and books uh, as being ownable or property rights, what it really does – because it's like literally impossible to own a song. What the law really does is it uses that as an excuse to give the owner of the song the right to take money from someone else. Now, the money is what they really own. Okay, So basically uh, an artist can use copyright, for example, which is one type of intellectual property law, to sue someone – to prohibit them from singing a song or publishing an album or publishing a book or selling a book unless they pay a fee to the owner of the copyright. So it's really just a disguised way of giving ownership in other people's resources like their money to these – to the holders of copyright. I was wondering if you could give a brief history of intellectual property here in the United States because in my preparation for this interview, I was reading a book called uh, – Against Intellectual Monopoly, I believe yes. is the name of it. By Bolton and, and Levine, yes. Yes, yes. I don't have it right in front of me. It's online, actually, againstmonopoly.org. Uh, it's, a, it's a great oh, book. It, okay. It's from an empirical point of view more than my view, which is more uh, libertarian, proprietarian, principled mm -hmm. base. But right. it is a very good book. Well, in this book, they were describing a little bit about um, how intellectual property uh, in the means of copyright uh, – actually helped authors in the United States. Actually, British authors would have their books published in the United States, and they had far more success selling their books because there were no copyright laws in the United States. So when exactly did copyright and patent and trademarks and all of that become so ingrained in the American, uh, just the psyche, the way of doing business? No, that's a good question. Um uh, there's another – it's a pretty short essay. It's by um, Carl Fogel. He's got a site called questioncopyright.org, and he's got an article on there where he goes into the history of copyright, which is pretty interesting. But I can just quickly summarize here. Um, most people now – we have a very capitalist, commercialized society where all these legal rights are traded back and forth, and you know we have stock markets and authors selling their rights, uh, assigning their rights to others, You know, J.K. Rowling making lots of money by doing movie deals. So we think in terms now of copyright and patent as just being part and parcel of a free market, advanced capitalist society. Copyright and patent… Uh, originated in the practice uh, – well, patent originated – patent is a type of legal right that protects the right in inventions, useful uh, processes or machines, let's say. Um, copyright protects uh, the works in artistic creations, okay, original works of, of, of expression. Um, copyright arose when the printing press started threatening the monopoly, the stranglehold that the church and the crown 
had on what thought could be disseminated, right? Because it was easy to control that by just having the scribes hand hand copy only the books that the church would permit them to to, to copy, etc. When the printing press originated, I think in the 1500s or something like that. Well, then you had the the threat of just books being produced on a wide scale wide scale basis without the control of the authorities. And so the core, uh, the the government established in England the uh, the stationers company, which was like about a hundred year guild system, which was like a monopoly system, which protected. Um, it was like the only way you could get a book published through the stationers company. When their monopoly ran out, the publishing industry was used to this situation and lobbied for a renewal of the charter, which was not granted. But instead, the Statute of Anne was passed in 1709, which was sort of the first modern copyright. It granted the copyright to the authors instead of to the publishers, but the authors, as a practical matter, had to assign their rights over to the publishing house just to get their works published anyway. So it 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 ended up – we ended up with the system which we see the relics of even today where you have a large publishing industry for novels, for songs, for software um, – where they have a lot of control, and the authors often make very little money because the publisher has a lot of upfront costs, etc. That model is being um, eroded a little bit because of the advent of e-publishing and Amazon and things like that, um, and uh, you know, uh, just the ability for artists to put their music online to get to get customers, etc. But that is why we had that industry emerge. Patents emerged um, in the phenomena of kings granting. Monopoly privileges to uh, court favorites in a certain area, just saying you're the only person who can make playing cards. You're the only person who can export sheepskin. They would just give them this monopoly because it gave them a competitive advantage, and in return they would get favors back from these people. Like they would they would become tax collectors for the government or, or something like that. This got to be abused by the king, and so the Parliament in England enacted the Statute of Monopolies in 1623 to rein this in. But they kept the right to grant monopolies for inventions. So patents emerged, arose historically in the practice of the state granting monopoly privileges to people, and copyrights arose in the practice of basically censorship. Um, and they've, evol they've evolved over time into in the U.S. Constitution when it was ratified in 1789 had a provision that gave Congress the ability to – protect the works of writers and artists and inventors, and the very next year, the Congress enacted the first patent and copyright statutes. So that's how we got to where we are now. Hmm. Well, I want to talk a little bit about your uh, – you take a very hardline stance against uh, intellectual property, obviously, as, your, as, your title, uh, as the title of your book suggests. But I want to get a little bit more detail as to how – do you view intellectual property actually hindering progress? For example, uh, someone patents uh, some invention. How does that hinder innovation, and how does that hinder progress? Okay, so here's the way I look at it. Let me just um, explain. I am a libertarian. I'm in favor of free markets. I'm in favor of capitalism. I'm in favor of knowledge and progress and innovation. I am also a patent attorney, so I know a good deal about it. I've been doing it for over – 22 years now. Um, so I have a, a lot of experience with the way the legal system works, the patent system, the copyright system, trademarks, and the other types of intellectual property. Um, the, the argument that is given for patent and copyright nowadays is usually not really a natural rights one. It's not really you deserve the ownership of these things because if you did, then they wouldn't expire after a certain time. Patents expire after about 17 years, and copyrights expire – like say 70 years after the author dies, but they're both finite terms. If this was a natural right, it would last forever, just like if you own a house or a watch, you could pass it on forever to your heirs. It wouldn't expire in a certain time. So most people that defend intellectual property now have a utilitarian justification. What they say is that we need to grant to artists and authors and creators um, movie producers, you know, songwriters, singers, and inventors – we need to give them a temporary monopoly to protect them from competition so that they would have the adequate incentive to produce these works, and that without these laws, we would have fewer works and an underproduction of creative works. That is the basic argument that's given. 
So my, my main objection to that argument is that they simply don't fulfill their, their argument. They don't have any evidence to back this up. It's just – it's said over and over again, but every study that you can find that's been done over the last 200 years and most of them in the last 50 to 60 to 70 years when we finally started looking into this, all the empirical studies, all the eco economic studies keep concluding that it looks like – there's no clear evidence that patent or copyright stimulate any increase in production of what it's supposed to stimulate, and in fact it has a severe distorting effect on the culture and on what's done, and it causes lots of costs which reduce innovation. Um, in the case of uh, technical innovation, which the patent field is supposed to cover, granting someone a patent uh, on a product can reduce innovation but for s in several ways. Number one… Let's say you have a company like um, um, Apple or other some of the other big smartphone companies, Motorola, um, uh, my, uh, uh, even Microsoft now, um, uh, Google. Okay, they have hundreds or thousands of patents which they paid lots of lawyers to get, and they are willing to defend those patents in extremely expensive lawsuits. So if you're like a new upstart innovator on the outside and you wanted to come up with a brand new smartphone design, you would be sued out of existence if you tried to compete because you wouldn't have the resources to come up with $10 million to defend yourself in several patent lawsuits that you're going to be hit with from the big guys. And even if you did have the money, you'd probably lose because they do actually have patents, and some of them are actually valid, and they would actually win their cases and put you out of business or buy your company. So that dissuades or discourages innovation um, in, in cases like that, and just as, as a general matter, um, companies are aware of, of what they call patent thickets where there are areas that are heavily patented, and they just steer clear of innovating in those areas because they know that it's pointless to innovate in that area because they wouldn't be able to sell their product anyway. So they just don't even engage in, in R&D in an area where they wouldn't be able to sell a product. So that's just one example. Um, the other example or, or another reason is that the patent system itself imposes extremely immense costs on the economy and on businesses. Um, Salaries for lawyers like myself, insurance costs, defending themselves in litigation uh, really does take away from the bottom line and causes the prices of products to go up. It makes the consumer worse off. It's basically like a huge, let's say, trillion-dollar-a-year global tax on, on technology, and that tax reduces the amount of resources that companies would have left over to engage in R&D in the first place. Um, another example is… If you have a patent or a series of patents covering a product, you have basically a 17-year monopoly window where you're not going to have any competition. So you don't have a big incentive to keep innovating. You don't need to. You can just rest on your laurels, and you don't need to keep improving your product a lot because you have patents. In fact, the only reason they're going to keep improving their products is to get a few more patents to extend their monopoly, but it's a game at this point. So there's lots of common sense examples and reasons you can point to as to why the patent system impedes innovation. But even if it didn't impede innovation, even if the patent system – even if you could come up with a study that showed that there's more innovation with a patent system than without it, that still doesn't show that it's justified because there's still a big cost to the patent system. Like let's say it's on the order of a trillion dollars a year. I've done studies. Other people have done studies. It's a big cost. Well, if the innovation that's stimulated is only worth $200 billion a year, but you're call, you're, it's costing the economy a trillion, it's still a net loss for the economy. It's still not worth it. So the advocates of patent – it's been 200-plus years. They really need to come up with a study showing that their system does what they say it does, and they have not, and they cannot. Hmm. Well, I want to turn the focus back uh, to music because this is a music-based podcast outside the music box. But you mentioned the uh, the printing press a little while ago, and the internet is very much like the printing press. Uh, it has very much the same effect as the printing press had in the 1500s, where now you can duplicate songs, you can duplicate uh, text just at, at the click of a mouse button. It's so easy. Yes. Uh, it's... I mean, compared to 20 years ago, it's it's so different. I want to get uh, your sense of what is it like 
for musicians now, just real world application. For example, I have a lot of musician guests on this uh, podcast, and a lot of them are promoting an album, and I will ask them to send me a file that because I like to play their music. I want to feature them as much as possible. So they'll send me a file, and I play it on the episode. What rights do I have? And I'm not just talking about theory. I'm talking about real-world application. To what extent do I own that file that they have sent me? So, uh, for example, if someone sends me something to play on one particular episode, do I have the legal protection to play that on any episode of this podcast that I want, just for example. Yeah, so it's not clear, and this is part of the problem with copyright. Um, Under my system, the way I would look at it theoretically is we wouldn't have copyright and patent, uh, and songs wouldn't have an owner. It's just information. If someone sends you a a song, um, then you have access to that information. You can use it however you see fit. If you have a contract with that person, either an implied contract or or an express expressly a negotiated contract where you agree not to use the music in a certain way or you agree to keep it private, then that's a private contract and that's fine. But we know these these things can only work so far because once information gets out, it's out. Right? Once knowledge is public, it's public and you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Under today's system, the way it works is um, whenever you whenever you create uh, an original work of expression, and it's fixed. What we call fixed in a tangible medium. That means you write it down or it's recorded somehow. It's not just a song you sing at a party that no one records. You don't have a copyright in that because it just disappears as soon as you're done. It's got to be fixed somewhere, written down on paper, stored in a medium, something like that, which it usually is. When that act happens, but the way the copyright work law works now since the 1980s is that copyright is automatic. You don't have to apply for copyright. You don't have to put a copyright notice on there. You can't even say no. You have a, the artist, the author has a copyright in that work, whether they want it or not. And it's almost impossible to get rid of. Now, when you when someone sends you this file, it's similar to sending an article to a magazine for them to consider for publication. And if they publish it, you really can't sue them for copyright infringement because you gave them, you you implicitly gave them license or permission to use it. That was the purpose of sending it to them. That's usually how that works. Um, you know, the more careful publications would send you a release or something to sign to make it clear. But even if they don't, then you know, it's just like if I if I pu- pu- publish a letter um, or, or a comment on a blog that someone else owns, I'm giving that blog owner permission to po- host my my copyrighted comment. It's just the way it works. So if someone sends you a song uh, in the context that you described, I would say that they're at least giving you implied permission to use it at least the first time um, for the for the purpose that you were you were both contemplating. But the nature of the internet is such that your podcast will be up maybe forever, and it's easily copyable by others. So whether you can use it down the down the road, I suppose if you try to use it over and over and you started having a commercially successful podcast and we're making money off of it, you could imagine getting an, um, a letter from the attorney from one of these early artists saying, I hereby revoke my permission for you to use this. Now, if you want to keep using it, you need to pay me money. And then either, whether they're right or wrong, you would have to take the risk of a big copyright liability, so you, you probably would just comply. You'd either pay them some money or you just quit using it. Um, as for the internet, you're right. There are parallels actually to the situation I explained earlier with the printing press. I think Cory Doctorow, who's a well-known tech advocate and, and, and author himself, he pointed out that the internet is the world's greatest copying machine, and it's never going to get harder to copy than it is now. It's only going to get easier and easier, and this bugs – it drives people nuts that are used to a model from the 60s and 50s and 70s where copying was hard. Okay, they, they built up publishing models and, and business models based on that, and they don't like the fact that it's easy to copy. But actually the fact that it's easy to copy is technologically a good thing. It's a great thing. This is how we communicate with each other. It's how we learn. It's how we spread information, but it will affect some business models. Um, so artists have to be aware that the world we live in now is a world of copying, and if you keep your stuff under lock and key and you use um, – uh, DRM and make it harder for people to use. They're just going to go on to the next guy, and you're going to be obscure and unnoticed. Um, so my impression is that 
you know, the LP era is pretty much dead except for, you know, uh, eclectic collectors. The CD era is basically dead. The DVD era is basically dead. And people aren't even buying songs on, on iTunes in MP3 format. Everyone's doing streaming now, right, or piracy. That's what people are doing. And the streaming models are great for the consumer. My impression is that the artists are not going to make as much money from the little payments they receive from Apple Music and Spotify than they would from sales back in the 80s. Or, or whatever. I think that that era has changed. Um, so artists are going to have to get compensated in other ways. They'll have to do it as a hobby, or they're going, like they've always done to some extent, or they'll have to perform at concerts. And you know, the more popular they are, the more the more fans they'll get, and the more they can charge. And they get popular by people knowing their music. So it's actually, I think, an artist and singer's benefit that. People can easily have access to their songs. Well, that's a great segue into, and you've been very generous with your time, but before I let you go, Stefan, I want to just get some practical advice from you because you're an expert in this field. Because a lot of uh, complaints that I hear from musicians is exactly what you've just talked about. Uh, they view the uh, music that is so easily, uh, so easy to be copied as a bad thing. But right. how how should a musician who is, uh, you know, they're not they're not um, Led Zeppelin. They don't have a big name, but they're trying to make a name for themselves in whatever right. niche that they find. How can they use the current uh, model or, or the current technology as it as it exists today to their advantage? Well, and let, let me mention one thing too. You you say that they don't like how easy it is to copy. However. How many of those people have themselves copied and benefited from the ease of copying? How many of these people have learned from the greats, from the you know, uh, from 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 history and even from recent days? I, I mean, it's been a great boon to them as well to have a a wealth of material to draw from, to to get inspired by, to sing, to cover at at their own concerts. So it's a it's a there's a little hypocrisy in this desire to be to benefit from the ability to copy others. And uh, wanting to, you know, close the door to heaven behind you once you get into the gate. Um, <laughs> and as far as practical advice, I did write a pamphlet which you mentioned. It's called uh, "Doing Business Without IP," and there's sort of two parts to that. One is like more of a theoretical thing, imagining how life would be like in a copyright-free world. We don't live in that world, so l let's talk about today's world. Well, there's a moral aspect to it. I would say number one, um, on the politics front. Just as a person, you should advocate for the abolition of patent and copyright. That's just what we should do as a correct policy position. And number two, I would say it's immoral – once you have a copyright and you can't help having copyrights, it's immoral to use it to sue people who are innocent people. You just shouldn't threaten that. You shouldn't do it. The government gives you this right. It's wrong. The government shouldn't give anyone that right, and it's wrong to use it against an innocent person. So I think you should not threaten to sue people. Um, but using your patents or your copyrights. So I think that's a personal ethical thing. Uh, in terms of how you actually make it given and navigate the, the actual system out there, you need to be aware of what the rules are. You need to be aware of the danger of copyright um, infringement you might get in trouble for. Um, uh, you know, if you sample the wrong things, if you if you put something on YouTube that has a clip of someone else's song, you could be in trouble, so you need to be aware of what to avoid doing, right? Um, and I think you also need to be aware that no matter what your your copyright rights are, that th th piracy is a real thing now, and it's just going to happen. Even even if we have the most draconian copyright laws you can imagine, which we pretty much already do, right? I mean, there are cr criminal penalties can be subjected for piracy. This is why Aaron Swartz committed suicide because he was facing. Years in prison, a young kid facing years in prison for copying some academic articles from 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 an Ivy League school. It was it was crazy. Um, you know, you need to be aware that piracy is just a thing now. The internet makes it possible to copy, so you have to be aware that you might make some money from some of the legitimate uh, avenues like Apple Music or Spotify. Um, but I think it's to the benefit of uh, um, an artist who's not Lady Gaga or someone like that to to get well known. Right, I think Cory Doctorow had another good line. You know, the 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 threat any author or musician has is not that people are going to pirate your work; it's that 
you're going to be obscure and no one's going to know who you are. That's the real threat. So I think you should people should encourage uh, if you have a concert, don't get upset that people are taking photographs or recording a few minutes with their iPhones. You know, be happy about that. Uh, make money from satisfying your fans in ways you can charge for, which is basically concerts or specialty gigs or uh, producing music for um, for someone's uh, documentary or for their movie or for their daughter's bar mitzvah. You know, there's lots of things people can do. Ultimately, you have to view yourself as an entrepreneur, and it's it's the job of the entrepreneur to figure out how to make money, and that is you have to look, you have to be creative. And we maybe have to be more creative now because of the challenges of easy copying and the internet. But it's also a great new world out there. I mean, you can be known. Um, you know, th there's there's some people on YouTube that are making millions of dollars a year because they're popular. They figured out how to be popular. They're not doing it because of copyright. They're doing it because they do. They're doing something that makes them popular. So ultimately, I would say produce excellent quality music and. Then, then it's going to be a, a good problem to have to figure out how to monetize that. Well, you have uh, opened a lot of cans of worms in my own mind, and I probably side with you more than a lot of people listening to this. So, Stefan, how can people uh, get in touch with you if they want to know more, a little bit more about uh, what you've had to say today? I have a podcast, which is on my website, stephankinsella.com, and I write a lot about the intellectual property issues on another blog, which is linked from there, but it's c4sif.org, which stands for Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom.org, uh, c4sif.org. All right. Well, we're certainly going to post links to that on the show notes, which you can find at outsidethemusicbox.com. But Stefan Kinsella, it has been a true pleasure to speak with you, and I thank you for sharing your insights with us. Thanks so much. I enjoyed it. And that'll do it for yet another episode of Outside the Music Box. My thanks to my guest, Stefan Kinsella, and my thanks to you, the listeners, for tuning in. As Bob Dylan said, the times they are a-changing. And it's time for us as musicians, as people, to think about things differently. And intellectual property is one of those things that definitely requires us to take a different look. Next week on Outside the Music Box is going to feature... Landau Murphy Jr., who is the winner of the 2010 season of America's Got Talent. He has an amazing story, and I can't wait to share it with you. So be sure to tune in next week on Outside the Music Box. Thank you.